Good evening and welcome to the latest episode in Jacobin's Stay at Home series. I'm Ronan Burtonshaw, the editor of Tribune magazine, Jacobin's affiliate publication in the UK. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Tony Benn, the life and politics of Tony Benn, one of the great figures of the British left and of the Labour left. Uh, but before we do, a few things to say to you all. Uh, I've been instructed by my friends in New York to ask you all to uh, like this video if you're watching it, uh, to subscribe to the Jacobin YouTube channel and to make sure to comment uh, throughout tonight so that we can pick some up for the question and answer session at the end. Uh, in addition, there's a few things to plug on our way, as there so often is. Uh, tomorrow on May Day, to celebrate May Day, Jacobin's Stay at Home series will have Connor Kilpatrick and uh, Chapo Trap House's Matt Chrisman uh, discussing May Day, the history of the workers' movement, the United States, and whatever else the two of those come up with to discuss in an hour-long uh, session, which you can only imagine. That'll be at 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern or 11 p.m. if you're watching us from the UK. Uh, and then on Saturday is the latest episode in the Jacobin Weekend series with Michael Brooks and Anna Kasparian. And they'll be interviewing Ryan Grimm from The Intercept. That's at 1 p.m. on Saturday, so please tune in for that. On the Tribune side of things, a brief introduction to who we are, for those who don't know. Uh, Tribune is a socialist magazine uh, that was founded in 1937 out of the popular front struggles against fascism in Europe. It went on to become the voice of the Labour left over the uh, coming decades. It was edited by Nye Bevan for many years until 1945 when he went on to serve in the Labour government and found the NHS. Uh, also by uh, Michael Foote. Uh, another uh, great figure of the Labour left who would go on to be a, a Labour leader uh, and featured luminaries including Jenny Lee and Barbara Castle and Ian McCardo and many, many great figures from the left of the party uh, over, over decades. Tomorrow, uh, Tribune will have a May Day series, uh, which you should all look at our website for, tribunemag.co.uk. Um, this series will include articles on the history of the workers' movement in Europe, on the string of wildcat strikes across the UK that we're seeing in, during this coronavirus uh, pandemic, and messages um, from leading figures in the, uh, in the workers' movement, and also um, from leading figures in the socialist movement. Uh, we also have an issue coming out soon, a special coronavirus uh, issue, which, uh, which Marcus, who you'll be listening to tonight, has written for. Uh, he's written a piece on the National Unemployed Workers' Movement, uh, which obviously has particular resonance today in the context of uh, the difficulties around unemployment that so many countries are finding. We have an offer at the moment, which I'm sure Kale can now flash up on the screen for all of you, uh, which is a special May Day offer that you can get uh, tonight if you want to subscribe to Tribune, a year of print uh, for £15 if you're in the UK or £20 if you're in the US. Uh, it's a very good offer. We won't be offering them all the time, so snap it up uh, if you're interested. On to the topic of tonight's conversation. Um, Tony Benn, of course, is a great figure of the Labour left. But his history, maybe outside of, uh, of those who have studied it, um, is a bit obscure. Uh, ben was not always uh, the champion of the, the, the Labour left and a, a major socialist figure. He is a standout figure in uh, Labour history as one of those who was radicalised by his experiences of government. Ben came into politics as a relatively centre-left figure um, from a kind of aristocratic uh, background. He fought a, a battle um, uh, against uh, the peerage, which he had inherited from his father, and to allow him to sit in the House of Commons as an MP. Um, and really, he continued a leftward trajectory throughout his career, but would have started uh, relatively in the middle of the party. And it was the experiences of being in government and being frustrated in his attempts to implement left wing policies that drove him to the left. And by the time the 1970s came around, Tony Benn was a, a champion of uh, alternative uh, solutions to the economic crisis. He was a champion of the cooperative movement of workers' control. He uh, became one of the the foremost voices of socialism in Britain. And by 1981, he stood for the deputy leadership of the Labour Party and almost won it, which was up until uh, Jeremy Corbyn's victory in the leadership election, probably the high point in the history of, of the uh, uh, Labour left. Um, 
Tony Benn, of course, became a renowned figure after that uh, on the Labour left uh, and in the international socialist movement, a key figure speaking out against war and imperialism, somebody who played a major role in the campaign over the Iraq war and also over uh, the, the atrocities committed in Gaza um, by Israel uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and he was to pass away in 2014, very sadly, a year before uh, Jeremy Corbyn became Labour leader. Uh, but for tonight, we're going to hear all about the career, the politics, um, the socialism of Tony Benn from Marcus Barnett. Marcus is the associate editor at uh, Tribune. He is uh, he works for the Communication Workers Union as well. Um, and as I said, he's a piece in our latest issue. Uh, and before I... Uh, spend any more time on this and go any further, uh, I will turn over to Marcus to discuss the uh, politics of Tony Benn. Oh, well, thanks for such a lovely introduction, Ronan, and uh, thank you to Jacobin uh, for having me on to talk about someone who meant so much to me in my political development. Uh, it's a real privilege. Um, so to start it all off, you know, obviously Tony Benn is a man who carries such, you know, political and personal significance for so many people on the British left. So I should maybe start with a personal anecdote. Uh, so I first met Tony Benn at a May Day rally uh, in Manchester City Centre when I was about 15, 16 years old. It was during the daytime, so I had to skive off school to go to it. And me and my friend Sam, we bunked off school and we went to watch him speak alongside people like, uh, I think it was Jack Jones, you know, the International Brigader, Tony Woodley, the current head of the TGWU at the time, people from the Stop the War Coalition, you know, all these, you know, real movement people. Before it started, uh, outside of the venue, I saw Tony smoking a pipe on his own. And uh, I just bought a magazine from some, you know, Labour left paper seller from just anywhere. So, so he could just sign it and I could uh, have a little chinwag with him. And, uh, you know, I became one of many people who learned that Tony was as deeply decent as you'd expect him to be. He engaged this, you know, slightly starstruck, truant kid like an adult, which amazed me. Uh, he asked me where I was from, which is a town called Chorley. It's like a large mill town a few miles north of Manchester. And uh, he knew it instantly. He heaped praise on my local Labour MP. And he told me something that I had absolutely no idea about. That uh, Derek Draper, who's the co-founder of Progress, uh, if any Americans are watching and don't know what that is, it's kind of like a Blairite pro-business lobbying group inside of the Labour Party. And uh, he also, you know, really hailed. Uh, it turns out Derek Draper hailed where I was from as well. Uh, I laughed. <laughs> I was really surprised. And uh, then he asked me if I was a Labour Party member. And you know, you've got to keep in mind at the time, this was, you know, the immediate years after the invasion of Iraq, which, you know, I was active in opposing in, inside of my school. Uh, I wasn't and I would have never even considered joining the Labour Party at this moment. So, you know, I told Tony very respectfully, of course, that I would have never felt comfortable being in the sort of party that a you know, sort of person like Derek Draper would feel comfortable in. And he rightly smiled, you know, fiddled around with his pipe a bit and said, uh, you know, in that inimitable accent that he had, well, wherever you end up going, make sure you don't end up there with them. And th that was my first personal experience of what a lovely man Tony Benn was. And, you know, though it was true, this 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 caricature of him as being such a decent bloke, but the way he was ever, ever elevated as a uh, kind of secular saint, a national treasure, the way that played out for so much of his life after the defeats of the 80s, no one was really more aware of this moral elevation than Benn himself, who told the BBC when he stood down in the 2001 general election that they're treating him like this because they think he's harmless now. You know, and certainly Ben was harmful to the power of the elites when he was in and outside of the Labour Party. The answer from them, just like the answer was with Jeremy Corbyn, it was, you know, un unequivocal. He was the most dangerous man in Britain, as one newspaper headline went. He had to be stopped at all costs. He had to be completely delegitimised at every step of the way and humiliated as a feral lunatic. Of course, both victimisation and elevation to national treasure served the same purpose, to obscure from reality the man and his ideas. So I hope that some of Ben's core ideas can come through tonight. And I hope that, you know, on both sides of the Atlantic, they can be of some use. So uh, let's start with his beginnings. So Tony Ben, full name Anthony Wedgwood Ben, was born in the London Borough of Westminster in April 1925. Uh, though he came staunchly from the upper middle class, there's no doubt that he came from dissenting stock. His mother, Margaret Wedgwood Ben, was the president of a small dissident Christian church called the Congregational Federation was an active member of the League of the Church Militant, which organised Christians to fight for the rights of women to be ordained as ministers. His father, William Benn, who would later be given the royal title of the, the Viscount Stansgate, was a left-wing liberal who defected to Labour and served in the 1929 Labour government. 
This meant that a young Tony met figures such as Ramsey MacDonald, who was soon to be disgraced for attempting to lead Labour into a unity government with the Tories, and Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian independence leader. Though through his father, he was related to the Reverend William Benn as well, who was an early dissenting minister in the eras, you know, initially following the English Civil War. At the outbreak of World War II, Tony Benn joined the Home Guard, a government auxiliary organisation intended to serve as a local resistance body against German parachutists, where he was taught how to use weapons for the first time. In 1943, he joined the Royal Air Force, where he served as a Spitfire pilot in Africa. Now, the Second World War profoundly shaped Tony Benn's worldview. He wrote very little detailed work about his own experiences, despite his beloved brother Michael dying in the conflict. But he often referred to the sheer scale of debate taking place from within the ranks of the armed forces over the sort of society that servicemen and servicewomen wished to return to. In one anecdote, which he was clearly fond of retelling, he would recall the soldiers' parliaments that were initiated by future left-wing MPs like Leo Absa, saying, we were discussing on a troop ship coming home once how we would deal with the problems of unemployment. And one lad got up and he said something that I've never forgotten. He said, in the 1930s, we had mass unemployment, but we don't have unemployment when we're killing Germans. He said, if you can have full employment by killing Germans, why can't you have full employment by building hospitals, building schools, recruiting teachers, recruiting nurses, recruiting doctors? And that's how we got it, of course. It, it was the 1945 landslide election for the Labour Party, which saw some of the greatest changes in British society that we've seen before or since. So following his demobilisation in 1945, Ben went to Oxford University, where he met Caroline Middleton de Camp, an international student and native of Cincinnati, Ohio, and proposed to her within nine days of meeting her. After serving as the president of the Oxford Union, Tony got an entry-level job with the BBC before becoming the Member of Parliament for Bristol South East. Now, his predecessor, Stafford Cripps, was a very interesting guy, an early bankroller of Tribune and a very active anti-fascist in the Popular Front campaigns of the 30s. Cripps was a Christian socialist who endorsed Tony to voters by saying that he was as much of a Christian as I am. Uh, he was known for his radical left opinions all the way throughout the 30s when he was very active in a Labour left body known as the Socialist League, you know, which amongst the many things that advocated for included a you know, rather eccentric thing to look at now, a democratically elected dictatorship of the Labour Party in the mid-30s. Uh, he was a figure who, at this point, Ben's politics didn't really align that much with, though later on in his life, he would be both favourably and unfavourably compared to him. So throughout his early period in Parliament, starting 1950, Ben was a fairly middle-of-the-road politician. He mostly backed out of the major battles going on between the party's left-wing supporters, led by Nye Bevan, and those led by the one-time party leader, Hugh Gateskull. Though Ben's moral framework was very much that of radical Christianity, he was and he was critical of the H-bomb. He very much met the conventions of a, you know, a fairly standard post-1945 social democratic MP. As such, he was never really intrigued in the politics of the keep left faction, which, although rejecting the tactics of armed revolution or democratic centralism, still fought at the local and parliamentary levels for full employment, a socialist housing policy, the nationalisation of the economy's commanding heights and all the other things that the Labour government seemed to err on us, you know, whenever it got into power. This is not to say that Ben entirely blended into the background, and by the 60s he began to show a different side. In November 1960, when his father died, he automatically became a peer, which was the law at the time. It was also the law that peers couldn't sit in the House of Commons, and a by-election was called for May 1961. Now, this caused a total constitutional crisis. Though he was barred from sitting in the Commons as a peer, he was re-elected by a nice 69.5% of the vote, despite voters being told clearly that he was a disqualified candidate. So despite getting less than half of Tony Benn's votes, the Tory candidate, Malcolm St. Clair, was declared the winner. However, Benn fought this in an extra parliamentary campaign, alongside other campaigns he was fighting in the local area around uh, worker segregation on buses, uh, taking an active role in the early wing of the anti-apartheid movement and other such struggles. And uh, through this campaign, he ended up forcing the Tory government to change this very arcane law with the Peerage Act of 1963, which allowed peers to renounce the titles. Ben, of course, was the first peer to renounce this title and was elected back into Parliament in a subsequent by-election. So this flutter of activity preceded the enthusiasm which met the 1964 general election, which saw a very narrow victory for a Labour Party led by Harold Wilson. Now, Harold Wilson was quite an interesting fella. Um, he was a former left-winger, 
He was a, almost a lieutenant, if you like, to Nye Bevan throughout all the major factional disputes of the 50s. And uh, he recognised that he owed quite a lot to the left here. And in the previous years, you know, the, uh, the Tribune group, or rather what became the Tribune group, uh, the Victory for Socialism group, have been organising selections across the board. And, you know, some degree of respect and recognition had to be given to this government in the left. And Wilson mostly took on board uh, progressive technocratic notions. And he gave Ben the, the postmaster general role and uh, was also the Minister of Technology from 1966 to 1970. Now, in these roles, Ben became known as a you know, quite competent, thoughtful technocrat. He's created with, you know, credited with creating various things like BBC Radio One, uh, the Concorde supersonic aircraft, and uh, even the British postcode system. Uh, but I think it's, you know, broadly fair to say that the clashes he was having with these unelected institutions, this role was what, you know, what was beginning to really radicalise Ben and putting him on a path of becoming much more intrigued about the dynamics and the reflexes of class power. And also things that he never considered, to be honest, about, you know, the seemingly impenetrable boundaries of the British state. So when, you know, he, so for example, Ben proposed something as innocent as introducing uh, what he called a non-traditional stamp designs. That means, you know, on the post, putting pictures of landscapes, uh, you know, pictures of historical figures, commemorative editions, uh, special Christmas stamps and so on, without the Queen's head on them. And uh, the resistance to this was so serious that uh, the Queen herself stood in to oppose him. And uh, after what he thought was a totally unnecessary, disproportionately heavy fight with the establishment, the compromise that was reached was that the Royal Mail would make stamp designs but with a very small Queen's head in the corner. And you know, th throughout these battles, he just had very much this like, aching sense that somehow democracy wasn't all it was cracked out to be in this sense and the more deep analysis from labor both in and out of power was necessary in order to you know tackle the challenges up ahead for us so when the tories and the ted heath surprised everybody with a 33 seat majority in 1970 uh, ben took the time to take a step back he started working on his political conclusions of the past couple of years and uh, out of this, he produced a, a pamphlet for the Fabian Society called The New Politics, A Socialist Reconnaissance. Now, in this pamphlet, Ben outlined his philo philosophical underpinnings. Uh, for him, it wasn't enough to draw a dividing line between support or opposition to status policies within Labour. For Ben, the issue is with democracy itself. What was the point of having a Labour Party which doesn't do what it promised when it gets into power? What's the point of having political democracy without industrial democracy? How can mass popular support be reflected inside of the state? And how can movements and governments work together to achieve this change? Those were the questions that Ben was trying to grapple with. On the extra parliamentary front, he did have a lot of, uh, a lot of things to work with here. So, you know, the early 1970s saw a really you know, serious period of class confrontation in the UK. As all the contradictions stitched together by the post-war consensus, you know, completely unraveled. And so Ben was equally inspired as he was practically informed by, you know, new shop stewards groups across the engineering industries, consumer associations, and new forms of rental and community associations that if they ever had existed, they certainly hadn't done, you know, in his adult life or before, you know, since 1945. So his reckoning was that Keynesian capitalism's offer, which produced rising incomes and a seat at the table of most governments for trade unions, just simply wasn't enough. He believed that new access to higher education and vastly improved workplace training in nearly all industries, alongside the new forms of visual media, had radicalised people far more than the status quo could hold. Ben believed that if these new forms of collective organisation could stick together and combine their talents, then serious victories could be gained against multinational corporations and the Tory elite. And indeed, Ben had, ben had plenty of reason to believe this. In 1971, the workers at Upper Clyde Shipbuilders in Glasgow launched a working against the closure of their yard which inspired Ben deeply and helped him shape his ideas. Around this time, at a speech to foundryman members of the AUEW union, he laid out his idea for full workers' control of industry as part of a broader policy that would extend to further nationalisation of the shipbuilding and aircraft sectors, as well as extend the public sector where companies were failing rather than offering state subsidies to corporations. In the speech, he put it clear enough, and I quote here, if we are going to talk about industrial policy, Let's start with the people. Let's forget about legislation for the moment and start talking about industrial democracy. And I mean industrial democracy. 
not just better communications or more personnel managers or consultations or company news sheets. Least of all, am I talking about one tame worker on the board of a company or trying to pretend that a few shares for the workers will make them all into little capitalists and iron out real conflicts of interest. I'm talking about democracy, and democracy means that the people ultimately control their managers. Just that, no less and no more. It's time we asked ourselves some fundamental questions about the management of industry. So ben was also very highly supportive of the Pentonville Five, five dockers who were jailed in July 1972 for refusing to obey a court order to stop picketing a depot. Their imprisonment was very brief, but after the trade union Congress called for a general strike to demand their release, that was when things started you know, really kicking into motion. At the time, Ben compared it to the persecution of the Tolpuddle Martyrs in the early 1930s, warning the Tory government that millions of people, whatever they may think of the rights and wrongs of the Dockers actions, will in their hearts respect men who would rather go to jail than betray what they believe to be their fellow duty to their fellow workers and the principles which they hold. He also demanded a general election which could allow the British public to decide how industrial strife could be dealt with. Do they want workers dealt with by a judge and tip staff and prison officers or by seeking the way of reconciliation based on fair play and concern and respect for our traditional human values? And in 1974, the Prime Minister Ted Heath asked a very similar question to the public and the Tory campaign was based around the simple slogan, who governs Britain, the government or the workers? And with a narrow margin of four Labour MPs, the public made up their mind. So that meant that in 1974, Labour were back in power again and they'd returned to government on a deeply radical manifesto. The forward to the manifesto, the name of which went out in Harold Wilson's, promised to eliminate poverty, emphasising full employment, improving people's social environments. It also pledged to, quote unquote, bring about a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth in favour of working people and their families. Ben was given the role for, of uh, Minister for Industry. Uh, but you know by Wilson but once again you know he found himself coming up against the civil service who had absolutely no interest in the things that he proposed the things that had set, been set out in the 1974 party conference and the things in the manifesto that were ratified by the British people he recalled later in an anecdote that senior civil servants took him aside and said to him in his very early days of working there look you have two options you can either go with the plans we both agree on and we can sell it to the press that everything is going very well or you can go ahead with the plans that you want and we can make sure that they fail. Ben, who had the unique eccentricity of becoming radicalised while being a senior politician, was still inspired by the acts of the clad shipbuilders and the determination of the organised working class movement. And he set, he set out trying to <coughs> democratise British industry. Working alongside Eric Heffer, a lifelong Christian and former communist whose memoir Never a Yes Man, is worth reading for its anecdotes of the civil services paranoia and taste for disruption, was also chosen to work alongside him. Sorry for the coughing, by the way, I'm a little sickly. So <clears throat> an extraordinary entry in Ben's diary, which you know also well worth reading from June 1974, describes his introduction to Anthony Part, the Department for Industries and Elected Permanent Secretary. It's a great example of the sort of things that socialists in civil services have to deal with if the state is organized against them and the state wants them to have no part in any particular processes. I mean, part was clearly a man who Ben had little or you know, no time for at all. There's another really good entry in his diary, uh, which describes part receiving a minor honor from the government uh, to which Ben like starts taking photographs of him and pretending to be his friend with it. And he comments that uh, part looked so ridiculous talking such simple and innocent pleasure from it all that it really gave me a feeling of being one upon him. But, uh, you know, Part was inflamed uh, at Ben's ideas of aiding Northern English regions struck by a lack of investment. And the, you know, Ben publicly touted these ideas with criticism of, quote unquote, industrial policies discussed in the comfortable atmosphere of Westminster, Whitehall and Fleet Street. So uh, Part accused him of inflaming the North versus the South. And in his defence, Ben said that his map of assisted areas was the most important map in Britain leading part to accuse him of inflaming people and quote unquote, raising temperatures. Ben promptly replied, not at all. I'm using very clear language and read out the introduction to Labour's 1974 manifesto. Well, said part, I have never known a minister in the whole course of my life in any party who has been like you. However, it wasn't only the civil service which was rejecting Ben's ideas for what, you know, he began to call workers control with management participation. 
Ben's connections with radical shop stewards at the Lucas Aerospace plant and in the shipbuilding works worried Wilson and the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, who were increasingly frightened by his desire to nationalise shipbuilding, aerospace and the British Leyland Car Company. However, with Britain entering an economic crisis in late December, Ben recognised a now or never time for change. In Cabinet, he argued that the government must either choose a monetarist deflationary route, which would require mass unemployment, but was being advocated by the civil service and the treasury, or his own alternative strategy, which was effectively one of protectionism, or as he put it, withdrawing behind walls and reconstructing and re-emerging. He argued that the choice of the Labour government was simple, accept a siege economy on either side, but either take his route, in which he would be supported by the unions and the people, or take the bankers' route, where the people would be attacking them. However, Cabinet totally rejected the plans with the exception of Peter Shaw, sending Chancellor Dennis Healy to the International Monetary Fund to secure a bailout. Now, inevitably, as we all know, that late 70s crisis led to a huge opportunity for Margaret Thatcher, whose you know, really energised Conservative Party swept the board with 62 new seats and a majority of 43 in 1979. The left found itself in complete disarray. Many believe that Thatcher's victory was a temporary blip formed from the chaos of 1979 where infamously even the municipal grave diggers refused to strike and refused to work and corpses were stacking up in morgues. This analysis seems understandable. Britain had gone yet again into recession in 1980 and many had blamed the monetarist obsessions of Sir Geoffrey Ho, Thatcher's chancellor, for pursuing a radical policy that led to a steep rise in unemployment. Opinion polls also showed that when Michael Foote, the old socialist stalwart and tribunite, became Labour leader in November 1980, the party began leading by double digits in the opinion polls. Despite being involved in the internal fight at the left, Ben's contribution is significant. At a much earlier time than most, he recognised that significance. In 1979 at the party conference, he warned delegates that this was a moment of truth, saying that, and I quote, the belief that the mixed economy could sustain full employment and rising public expenditure had turned out to be an illusion. He saw that the public and political consensus for the post-war settlement was completely falling away and that the desire for real change was stronger than ever. The growth of the European Economic Community, which became the European Union, had led to an undermining of the national state's ability to manage economic affairs, and the growth of automation was leading to pressures on traditional sectors of British industry. In a further piece in March 1980, he wrote that, <coughs> we have a capitalist system in this country which is no longer capable of sustaining the welfare upon which so many of our post-war politics rested. The real problem is not that the Tory government are pursuing their policy, but that there is no alternative to their policy unless we are prepared to achieve a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of power in favour of working people and their families. So this set Ben on the offensive. Against figures on the right, such as Dennis Healy, and those on the more opportunistic wings of the left, such as Neil Kinnock, Ben believed in the desperate need to turn Labour into a party that clearly articulates the case for socialism. He pushed politics such as the alternative economic strategy, which if anybody's really interested in, is very usefully elucidated on in a book you can easily find by Sam Aronovich called The Road from Thatcherism. However, the alternative economic strategy, which was a vision of a Britain outside of the EEC structured around job security, import controls, tight banking and insurance regulation, as well as a heavy taxing of the wealthy, was not to be. The Labour left wanes as it attacked itself throughout the 80s. Ben's deputy leadership campaign, where he came within half a percentage of beating Dennis Healy, was initially greeted as a possible floor for the left, but was shown all too long to be a ceiling. Given the current period, uh, I don't really want to go too much into the factional wars of the 80s, not, left, not least because in this moment, I want to do as little possible to encourage anybody to repeat those grave, destructive mistakes. However, there's no doubt that throughout the 80s, you know, times that were incredibly tough for active socialists, Tony Benn remained a core organising figure. Though he continued on the offensive when all seemed completely impossible, like in the 1988 leadership election, where he took 11% of the overall vote to Neil Kinnock's 89%, Ben was always interested in building the base up and preparing new ground for socialists to fight over. His fantastic collection, Fighting Back, Speaking for Socialism in the 80s, is easily available from most charity shops or online second-hand places, and it's, you know, it's really well worth getting, particularly if you're you know, new to Tony Ben's writing and his thought. I think that at a time of great defeat, it shows you the real political understanding of the man in depth. But what, what, I, what I always found anyway, interested in the collection is that despite his choice of unpopular issues in the book, issues where he defended 
it goes to Spanish West Africa's Britain, the African National Congress, unemployed protesters, the Catholic minority and the troubles in the north of Ireland, the anti-nuclear movement. Ben emphasised the importance of a long tradition of anti-establishment sentiment. He describes people like Paul Robeson, Karl Marx and Thomas Paine. He also describes the British radical tradition, a notion he had of total refusal to accept the values of great, you know, to accept the values of tiny minorities of people by the great many be they the church, the royal family, or the modern state. These were the same forces that Tony Benn fought against his entire life, whether he was speaking to workers occupying the shipyards, grappling with civil servants over economic policy, or reading out the details of the Gaza Emergency Fund on the BBC in 2009. And I'd like to end on a brief paragraph from the same speech, the foundryman that I mentioned above, words that Ben said should be absolutely key to the British movement. In that speech, he said that our movement must mean more power to people. It must mean believing in people and their capacity. It must mean sharing responsibility more generously and through a juster and fairer distribution of income, giving more economic power to people who now experience employment or poverty so they can enjoy the fruits of their own labor and the labor of us all. This is the heart of our socialist belief. I'm sure that unless we present it firmly and believe in it and argue for it and keep at it until we have persuaded people to accept it, we shall never be able to defeat the philosophy of the government that is now in power. Only we, by our own efforts, can show the nation that there is another and better way. Thank you very much, Marcus. I think you can all uh, hear me now. I'm about to go and do the, the Q&A session. Uh, but first, before I do, uh, a little reminder uh, to go and like this video to subscribe to the Jacobin YouTube page and to make sure to check out both myself and uh, Marcus's uh, project over at Tribune magazine, it's tribunemag.co.uk. The first question I wanted to ask you, Marcus, is about Tony Benn in the context, you mentioned it a little bit there, of uh, the English radical tradition. So obviously Benn is a, is a figure who I learned from Marx but doesn't really describe himself as a Marxist. Uh, his socialism is a Christian socialism. It's a kind of uh, socialism that emerges from within a deep English radical tradition that's inspired by the figures of the English Civil War, that's inspired by Tom Paine, um, and, and a kind of uh, Republican democratic idea of society. Can you talk a little bit about Ben as a figure of the English radical tradition? Mm. So, yeah, obviously the uh, English radical tradition was something that Ben was very interested in himself. Um, a few decades ago, he published a uh, compilation of English radical writing from the Peasants' Revolt up until, uh, you know, anti-poll tax declarations, I think. It was called Writing on the Wall, and it's a, it's a, it's a, great, little, uh, it's a great little anthology. Um, and I, I think that this is something that Ben always identified, you know, with very, very clearly. The guy only read the Communist Manifesto on Christmas Day in 1976 when his wife Caroline uh, brought it to him. You know, so he... <laughs> And, uh, you know, he said that after years of working things out via his own analysis, he finally found a figure, you know, the age of 51, he found in a figure like Karl Marx, someone who'd been thinking on entirely the same lines as him for years. And, uh, you know, the revelation was, you know, truly astounding to him. And uh, he really saw it as completely parallel, utterly lined up to his own, like, Christian socialist values too. And um, I think that, you know, completely feeds into effectively, like... <laughs> everything the Ben family seems to have stood, stood for since the uh, 1600s, you know, as I mentioned, uh, one of his very distant relatives was a dissenting minister. Um, his father defected to the liberals. There's, there's always been that wing of his thought, which includes this. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's really, you know, valuable and interesting to you know, re reflect on it in those terms. Um, yeah. A question coming in from uh, Datalor. I hope that's the right pronunciation of these names. Um, on the YouTube comment thread. He asks about Ben's approach to the structures of the Labour Party. What structural changes did, did Ben pursue? Um, so maybe particularly it's worth discussing mandatory reselection, which obviously even today in the Labour Party is a, is a hot button topic. Mm. So um, obviously the Labour Party has never been a, uh, you know, Ralph Miliband says you know, very, very early on in uh, parliamentary socialism, the, uh, the Labour Party has never been just like a social democratic or socialist party. It's specifically a Labour Party. You know, it's a, it's a federated party, really, of several other minor parties, be that socialist societies, uh, you know, sort of nonconformist Christian groupings, uh, trade unions, uh, radical liberals. It's always been a, uh, you know, ver yeah, variegated organisation. 
And, uh, you know, as Ben said himself, you know, it's ne never been a socialist party, but it's always been a party of socialists in it. And uh, one of the big debates that emerged in the 70s, uh, you know, particularly between uh, local activists and, uh, and you know, what they saw as a party establishment was the basically just like the lack of any accountability in MPs. You know, it really started flaring up once uh, Ben's you know, alternative strategy was rejected at cabinet level. And uh, people were broadly the impression, as they are today, to be honest, that the PLP is far, far to the right of you know, your average Labour Party member and even your organised Labour Party members. So there's been a very, very long battle to democratise the Labour Party instead of the, you know, the, the previous existing system up until recently. We don't fully have mandatory selection yet, but we have a, you know, a democratic improvement on it that was, you know, came out of Corbynism. <coughs> Uh, you effectively had to run a very, very aggressive, uh, almost like a hate campaign against your Labour MP. You know, they had to do something truly appalling for them to be removed. And even then, there was the ability of the National Executive Committee to overturn the democratic ruling of local uh, local parties. So infamously, Frank Field, who uh, quit the... He was, he's, you know, he was an MP until December 2019. Uh, he quit the party under Corbyn because of the direction it was going in. But he was deselected in, I think, 1980 seven by his local party and uh, another candidate was selected but that was overturned by the national executive committee which at that point was you know leaning to the right and uh, was very hostile to the organized left so it was always this huge huge you know fight to make sure that the party is much more in the hands of members uh mandatory selections obviously that um i feel like under corbynism so many new people joined that when the argument never really filtered through because people were only aware of the need to change MPs until it was very, very late. I feel like the, you know, <laughs> it seems like the easiest thing to say in the world, but next time we'll have a better chance of doing this. But you know, there always might be a next time, you know, but that seems to be the case. But there's, there's other things too, like there's a very traditional demand of the Labour left, again, after the 1974 conference, uh, to make the party entirely accountable to the decisions made at a uh, conference. Um, I mean, that would take very rigorous constitutional change because I believe that in the constitution of the Labour Party, um, you only have to, the, the, you meaning the leader, only has to take the uh, the agreed resolutions of Congress as like a sort of um, a way to inform your processes in developing policy, developing the manifesto that you fight an election on and so on and so forth. I admire your optimism there. The next time, yeah, let us uh, let us try and organise for that. Toughen up, eh? Toughen up, Ronan. Toughen yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Um, and, and another thing you mentioned a bit there, I suppose it relates to the, the Labour Party question, is Ben and democracy, right? So one of the big things that stands out about Tony Ben's political record is this defence of of democracy and not, uh, you know, the kind of parliamentary or liberal democracy, but the idea of a radical democracy that would extend to the workplace where it wasn't just about public ownership, it was about uh, democratising those industries that were publicly owned. It wasn't just about... Um, taking control of the workplace. It was making sure there was workers' democracy. Uh, so this was a big kind of feature of, of Ben's political career. Uh, and it did kind of make him different to maybe some of the more traditional left figures who um, had very good socialist politics, uh, but were perhaps less concerned with uh, the democratization of the workplace and also democratization of the party, democratization of politics. So can you speak a bit about Ben as the, the radical Democrat, this figure who was... Uh, trying to empower not just um, a section of socialist politicians, but actually working class people more generally. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really interesting part of him. It's, you know, one of the most uh, alluring aspects of Benism, I think. I mean, when you contrast uh, Ben's thought to, say, the, uh, you know, the, the Keep Left pamphleteers in the 1940s, you know, people like Ian Mercado, you know, who's a great personal hero of mine, but, you know, someone who's effectively just arguing for, uh, you know, you know, you're going to nationalise everything step by step by step. The, the road to freedom is just you take this industry, you take this industry, you take this industry. And um, that was always like, a you know, the main push forward. You know, there's no broader questions beyond just pushing forward to the point where you're nationalising, you know, the, the people who, you know, make the pins and, you know, just absolutely every single thing. And that was basically the, uh, the, the linear path for the Labour Party. You keep on doing that. Um, but there was, you know, Mikado himself came from a middle management background. Uh, he pushed a very technocratic idea of socialist democracy on that. 
it was more that you gain freedom by the liberation of oneself from vested interests and your collective negotiation with the state can, you know, bring you more like, you know, real terms freedom in your private life. But, you know, Ben in that Fabian Society pamphlet, he's discussing like the new freedoms of the 60s and 70s, you know, the mass media, the ability of people through increased education and technical training to engage with things in a way that he argues people had never fully engaged with before. And he believed that the post-war settlement gave people a taste for a lot of these things and he wanted more. And the promise of it couldn't, you know, the capitalism couldn't live up to the reality of it. So the next step was to keep on pushing forward and going against the grain like that. And uh, he argued that, you know, the Labour Party should be caring about democracy and, uh, you know, the, the movement should be as wide as life itself, which is, you know, one of his uh, flowery phrases. Um, but it's also not just that. It's, you know, it's... Uh, it's not just from that, that gut feeling. It's also from, uh, it's about, the you know, sort of uh, as a form of confrontation, you know, like the way he saw it was, you know, how can you democratize uh, the state? How can you democratize society if you don't democratize the Labour Party? So these things that are very much considered, uh, you know, or at least, you know, uh, demonized and characterized by the right wing as, you know, flimsy, you know, internal affairs of the Labour Party and muckraking and so on. You know, they're really, really important things you know how it's a good question you know you need to you need to take the labor party because it's the opposition if you take the opposition you know, you'll never take the tories but you're, you're well on your way to taking the state there aren't you and it's a very important tactical question for the socialists to, to deal with before we go on to the next question i remind everyone that we have that special mayday offer for tribune if you want to keep hearing reading what marcus barnett has to say about politics which i would highly recommend uh, it's bit.ly forward slash Tribune May, all lowercase, and you'll find that offer. Um, while you're talking there about democratizing the party, taking the Labour Party to the left, obviously Ben, I, I suppose particularly for a US audience, he's an interesting figure because he's a socialist in parliament. Uh, he's a figure who believes in um, the parliamentary road, or at least as he called the democratic road uh, to socialism. Uh, he believed in trying to win power through winning parliamentary majorities and using uh, left-led governments to uh, support the workers' movement and socialising the economy and so on. Uh, what do you think is the lesson of Ben's kind of life as, a, as an MP, both where he's in government, where he's a, an opposition, and then also his like later life where he's a, a, this backbencher making the rabble-rousing speeches against war in particular? Well, it depends how far you want to go with his life. I mean, um, he obviously left Parliament in 2001 to, you know, in his words, spend more time in politics. And, uh, you know, if that seemed like hyperbole at the time, it certainly wasn't when 9-11, uh, the invasion of Afghanistan, the war on terror rolled around. And he played a role that I think uh, in those years that, you know, in my opinion, at least as a, you know, a teenager throughout those years, certainly rivaled the 1980s. You know, he was seen as this... Uh, you know, this new moral crusader against uh, what New Labour and what Tony Blair was doing in the Middle East. And, you know, he occupied a really, really important role. I think he gave hundreds of thousands of young people a really, really clear understanding of, you know, uh, of the war on terror, of imperialism, of the, uh, you know, very morally dubious nature of what was going on in our name. Um, and his diaries at that point are absolutely fascinating, you know. But then you see it, towards like you know much more closely towards the end of his life you know i would argue that there's a almost like a different ben where like you know towards the very end of his diaries his uh you know seemingly endless optimism of the other diaries seems to, it seems to kind of pop it out a bit and uh you know this insistence he always had that the labor party was the engine of social change even seems to be kind of uh erring about that so i'm sure if anyone would have asked him more clearly about parliamentary questions at that point he would have given a fascinating answer but I think, I think there's a, a few things about the role. I think that one of the interesting things about Ben, like lots of other people, and if you, uh, if you get this, if, <laughs> if you get the latest issue of Tribune coming out, there'll be an article about Peter Shaw, someone else who believed in this. But um, although Ben was entirely in favour of constitutional change, uh, he recognised the system of parliament. He was attacked very aggressively by people at the New Left Review over this. But he totally believed that the roles of... Uh, you know, Parliament could be used very, very fruitfully by the, the left and the Labour movement. He recognised that the way the way that the British uh, lack of constitution operated, it meant that if you could take a socialist Labour Party into power, you your, your power, you know, would be effectively limitless. 
and uh, he really really saw the role in that and he saw the role of the social movements to push you know that party into the as you said role in the democratic road i mean to make sure that they could before yeah just to cut across yeah that i think is worth expanding on in the context of his european views too because um a lot of people now um, but particularly, I would say, in the kind of liberal left sphere, people who might read The Guardian to get the news in, in British politics wouldn't really understand the concept of somebody who was left wing and in favor of leaving the European Union. The whole thing is cast as, as a kind of right wing nationalist project. Um, Tony Benn's own views have been kind of caricatured in recent years as a little England opinions. But actually, the truth of it is, uh, as you're saying, his, his view of the European Union was very much that it threw up obstacles to a potential radical socialist government um, that wouldn't be there just through the English uh, parliamentary or constitutional system. So maybe speak a bit about, about that and Ben's Euroscepticism. Well, absolutely. I mean, even when you look at what him and Eric Heffer were doing uh, in the, uh, you know, in the uh, industry department, uh, you know, one of the main complaints that Heffer makes in his memoirs is that, you know, whenever the civil service or the right, you know, like Harold Wilson as the right wing leader of the party, uh, whenever he was getting nervous about something that they were doing, uh, they would basically move like that economic detail to the foreign department for the international secretary to deal with because he recognized it would go through Europe there and therefore be effectively exempt from nationalization. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that Ben took very, very seriously. You know, as you said, um, you know, lots of people write him off as like a left nationalist and you know, someone who wasn't particularly, you know, uh, you know, progressive or whatever, because he didn't believe in Europe. But that's like complete nonsense, you know, like all of Tony Benn's rhetoric is internationalist. All of what he believed in was internationalism. His views, much like E.P. Thompson's were similarly derided. They were founded out of that international coalition against fascism that existed after the Second World War, you know, and the true uh, fraternity that existed amongst peoples after 1945. Not some top-down imposed neoliberal you know sort of a uh, bullshit take on that and um <laughs> you know to put it bluntly and um i mean of, of the many things of benism i think that you know the idea that you, you know if there's no point I mean, if you'd like to extend it further there's no point democratizing the labor party if a european state is just going to impose itself upon you or whatever you do you know there's no point hoisting the red flag in london if uh, that's just going to get it you know onto you and I think that's something that a new generation of people would certainly, particularly in the context of the Euro crisis now, they could really go go back and look at some of Ben's writings about the uh, EEC referendum, uh, talking about his arguments about keeping out of the market. Um, I think they're well worth returning to. William Robinson asked a little bit about um, Tony Benn books. Obviously, there are a number of famous ones, arguments for socialism, arguments for democracy, his diaries, which you, which you raised yourself. Um, I think those are all very worth reading. We've also um, published uh, some of his writing on the Tribune and Jacobin sites uh, uh, after, of course, uh, Tony Benn himself had passed away. So I recommend uh, that. And there's also Will and Testament, if people want to watch um, a movie about Ben or a documentary about Ben, uh, that's really, really worth watching. Uh, Rabia Khan in the comments asked a bit about Ben and Fabianism. So how, you know, Tony Ben, who at one stage was uh, was involved in the Fabians, sitting in the EC and so on. But how would you contrast kind of Ben's view of politics, um, one which was a kind of democratic socialism, but with big emphasis on workers' control, democracy and so on, to, to the Fabian kind of gradualist approach? I think you're just summarizing yourself there. You know, the, the Fabians were effectively, uh, you know, a very paternalistic force on the labor movement. They didn't really believe that ordinary people could do it. They just think they thought that ordinary people causing a bit of a fuss, which could then be repackaged and sold to, you know, by sympathetic sections of the ruling class to less sympathetic, but probably more influential sections of the ruling class. They thought that could effectively do the job. Uh, that's what Sydney and Beatrice Webb pushed for. Um, it was never this, you know, all-encompassing radical socialist approach that Tony Benn went for. Um, I should clarify that he didn't, you know, there wasn't that sort of ideological cohesion within the Fabian society at the time. Uh, throughout the 60s, you know, they were publishing all sorts of things by people like Woodrow Wyatt, Ian Mercado, um, Michael Meacher. You know, the Fabian society were interested in developing these ideas and, you know, pushing them. And uh, they may not have had at this point the kind of uh, reputation they may have had recently as like a bit kind of wetter and a bit softer than Miliband and Corbynism. They were trying to produce a real intellectual trend there, but, you know, to 
to answer your question, I think if there's a, a difference between Benism and Fabianism, I'd say the one word to you know contrast them both is participation. We published a, a piece recently in Tribune, um, Ben at 90, by Leo Panich and Colin Lays. And in it, they emphasize Ben's connection to the social movement tradition. Uh, so particularly, they're talking about um, Ben's embrace of things that maybe were being more slowly embraced in, in the Labour Party, um, the black liberation, the women's movement, the anti-war movement, and, and so on. Uh, but also, they raise a, a very interesting point, which is Ben is really the first figure to make an internal Labour Party election a movement election with mass rallies and demos and, and so on in, in support of, uh, of his cause to be deputy leader in 1981. Uh, what do you think was Tony Benn's relationship to the kind of social movement left? <coughs> well, it was, it's a good question, isn't it? Because um, did you mean the social movement left in terms of, you know, 1995 onwards? Oh, I mean, before that. So the idea mm -hmm. of the movements that are coming out, uh, you know, outside of the party. So outside of social democracy, outside of the union. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... He clearly saw that they had a really vital role to play in the ecosystem of the labor movement. He saw that, you know, the revival of these things like uh, tenants associations, uh, consumer rights groups. I think in that Fabian pamphlet, one of the things that he uh, takes particular inspiration from are uh, people organizing to like reduce sound in their local areas, you know, and like noise pollution. It's like a weird little one <laughs> that caught me off guard when I read it. Um, but he was, you know, he was really interested in these new forms of uh, social self-organization. And he thought that they were reflective of this change in uh, in society that's taken place since the uh, you know since uh, 1945, and he figured that they had a role to play and uh, they should be welcomed in the labour movement, and the party should be looking towards these people as broader you know more reflective of society than perhaps what the Labour Party was then, you know which was uh, you know not not quite like that yet, and uh, yeah. So, Alan, Alan Kennedy asks about the, the Watt Diaries, so I'll, I'll tell him the one that he's uh, specified there, which is the time that Ben is in government. I think those are some of the most interesting diaries. You you mentioned them in the talk. Um, these are the ones where you read about the way in which the civil service uh, is trying to undermine Ben and his, and his plans, particularly his plans around things like workers' cooperatives uh, and so on. But before we go back into uh, that period too much, I want to ask you about the alternative economic strategy because you mentioned it in your talk uh, and it remains on the Labour left probably the most well-developed programme even after the years of Corbynism and of course some great policy was produced and, and so on in the last five years. Uh, but it, the alternative economic strategy probably remains the best and most complete economic programme um, uh, for what response uh, you would make if you were a socialist government um, you know overtaking uh, taking over I should say a capitalist state at this time uh, mm -hmm. but there are all these questions now, how viable was the alternative economic strategy if they had won the battles at cabinet level and through the party did they really have a movement that could defend the kind of program that radical did they have enough of a base in the unions did they have enough of an independent kind of socialist force that could push this through did they have enough support among the people amongst the working class of britain uh, to push this through these are questions that are asked of us by the right and i think they're fair so what's your view on them i think that if there's one thing to say about it it's that the labor movement wasn't well organized enough that's effectively what it was we pulled off some absolutely incredible, you know, really, really serious victories in the early 70s. You know, like um, in the miners' strike in 74, uh, you know, you had like Labour MPs, you know, not even left-wing Labour MPs, like just union-sponsored Labour MPs saying that they're going to be declaring armed conflict on the coal fields if the police continue the way they're, they're carrying on in terms of, you know, brutalising miners and breaking up picket lines and so on. The level of confrontation was so heavy and... You know, you had like 10,000 engineering workers turn out to, you know, physically stop the police from harassing the miners in Birmingham, Saltley Gate, in, you know, that year. And it was just such a sheer scale of organisation. Like, uh, I used to have, you know, I used to know this uh, this old fella, and I remember him talking to me about that strike and uh, basically that the police messed around with their car, uh, put, you know, pulled them over, uh, popped their back tyres and said, like, I think you better go now. And... Uh, you know, they, they were just like young, 
champagne enthusiasm revolutionaries and uh, he said to the copper like, oh, like, we'll get our own back and retake power. The copper said to him, like, well, what happens if we take power first? You know, and like these, these times are incredibly serious and, uh, a f- you know, few people in the Tory cabinet were kind of up for the challenge, but, you know, there was cons- really significant conservative figures like Sir Alfred Sherman, Keith Joseph, Thatcher, who were very, very about recognising the crisis and really pursuing uh, their solution to a crisis with a very heavy hand. And um, I think the Labour movement, broadly speaking, you know, with, with really honourable exceptions, I think that was, uh, I think we were completely uh, off guard with that. And uh, we're all paying the cost for it now. Can't blame those people because the uh, the scale of the defeat is clearly, you know, we're still living with it today. It's clearly absolutely, you know, very difficult to grasp. But, Here's a question that I didn't, I just come to my head now. Could Tony Benn have done more in the aftermath? Let's let's not go back over and really the game in the eighties because we know all the complications and the defeats and so on that were that were suffered in that period. But when you look beyond them, um, obviously it took us until the crisis and and so on. Pretty much across the Western world, that was the case for there to be a revival of socialism. Was it possible? Do you think that uh, that Tony Benn could have? done more in that case is it possible that a figure like tony ben who had huge support and the the left um who up, as you say until the early 2000s was in uh was in parliament um somebody who then ends up as a key figure in this mass movement against the iraq war um what what's your view on his contribution in those periods of time i mean is it is it possible to say that Tony Benn could have produced more in terms of uh, socialist um, organisation and power inside the Labour Party, at least in that period? I think it's very, very hard to judge, uh, given the overall demoralisation of the people in the party, in a way that, the, you know, the, the right, I mean, there's a, there's a great book to, you know, you can, you can kind of learn about Benism, really, through uh, a lot of the, you know, visions of its opponents. You know, so there's a great book by John Golding, who was a leader of the Labour right, called Hammer of the Left. And in that, he basically describes how, you know, the cadre of the right wing of the Labour Party just destroyed the socialist wing of the Labour Party. And this is a sort, this is a sort of book you read when you're a, a fairly, you know, significant Labour First organiser or a progress organiser. And, uh, you know, it, it shows you all of the, all the errors we made, things we walked into, the sheer effort and energy that the right put in to destroy us. Um, I think we probably underestimated that energy and that power that the right had to just completely cut us out of the picture. Um, in the in the YouTube comments, um, Trimmel asks about Ben and Corbynism. What would Tony Ben have made of the victory of Jeremy Corbyn a little over a year after Ben dies in the Labour leadership election? Would he have foreseen it, and what would he have made of it? Well, I mean, he obviously would have loved it. Um, you know, uh, I think Max Shanley, uh, who's a brilliant socialist writer that you should all you know read. Uh, his name is Max Shanley. And he was the kind of uh, last protege of Tony Benn. And uh, I hope this is all right, actually, saying this, Max, if you're watching. Um, but he spoke to a relative of Tony Benn's and he said, you know, if Ben had lived one more year and seen uh, Jeremy get elected, he would have lived five more years. You know, Jeremy, you know, in his final diaries, uh, he says that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell are pretty much the only MPs that he trusts any longer. Um, he says that he, he was genuinely worried they were going to be expelled from the party at some point. And uh, I think it really would have, you know, it would have, well, understandably been an incredibly deep emotional thing for him to have witnessed them to have become leaders. And as a final question, uh, Peter Gowan asks, what Tony Benn's message to the Labour left today would be? So in the context of the defeat of Corbynism, the defeat in the general election, the defeat in the Labour leadership election, what would he be saying to us today about the path forward for socialists and Labour? I think he'd be saying that we have never been really, numerically speaking, in a stronger position than this. We've got a mass party of half a million people, most of whom, you know, are, are, you know at least well over half, uh, are committed to socialist ideas. Uh, we've got various national unions who are completely on board with the same vision that our members have. And um, we don't have a Labour leader who's aggressively committed to the right. All, it's all to play for. It's all to play for. And if we can keep on fighting to bring that new generation of socialists through, we'll have a new, a whole new tranche of socialist leaders in the party that can develop the, you know, the further membership for tomorrow. And I think he'd probably be saying what he always used to say, you know, there is no final victory and there is no final defeat. 
So toughen up, bloody toughen up. It's a lovely end. And folks want to go and look and find some more Tony Benn quotes. There are many, the tree of capitalism quote, we are a moral crusade, uh, a lot of things to warm uh, the heart on a uh, pandemic evening, if that is what you're interested in. Um, thanks very much for, for tuning in. Thanks to, to Marcus. A few things before we go. Uh, tomorrow in the Stay at Home series, there is a special May Day conversation between Connor Kilpatrick and Matt Chrisman from Chapeau Trap House. That's at 6 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UK time. So tune in for that. Uh, this weekend and Saturday, there is uh, the weekends with Michael Brooks and Anna Kasparian. Their guest is Ryan Grimm from The Intercept. And also, we have a special pandemic issue of Tribune around the corner. If people want to subscribe, I'm sure Kale can put the subscription code up now. It's £15 if you're in the UK with our May Day offer, and it is £20, uh, the equivalent, if you're in uh, the US. It's bit.ly slash Tribune May, all lowercase. So please do subscribe. Tomorrow, we have a May Day series on Tribune, which will include pieces uh, by leading figures in the British Trade Union movement. It will include uh, articles looking at the, the uh, wave of wildcat strikes uh, in response to the pandemic uh, in the UK. It will look at the history of the workers' movement in Europe. We're going to have some great pieces, so please do check us out, tribunemag.co.uk, and also on Twitter at Tribune Magazine, uh, all the one. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. I hope that uh, the hopeful message of Tony Benn, uh, the message about workers' control, the message about the possibilities of socialism and the moral crusade that Ben spoke about us all uh, being a part of uh, resonated with you. Uh, I think for those of us who, uh, who have uh, responded to and have to respond to a number of defeats, whether it be of Corbyn or Bernie or other ones across the Western world in recent years, and Syriza, and, uh, you could even say possibly Poremos, Mélenchon in France, uh, it's, been a, it's been a difficult period of time for all of us. Uh, and in these moments, figures like Tony Benn make a difference people you can turn to for inspiration, people you can turn to uh, who gave conviction to thousands of people who inspired them to get involved in politics and to turn to socialism. Uh, so we all have a great debt that we owe, uh, a debt, I think, in terms of what Michael Foote used to say, a debts of honour. We, we all have one of those debts to Tony Benn. Uh, so thanks very much to Marcus for uh, giving us his talk tonight about the politics and the life of Tony Benn. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.